Okay, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We are concluding this series today. Uh, four parts is quite short for a series these days, eh? <laughs> um, and today we're going to look at Elohim as bridegroom. Well, we've covered quite a lot of stuff over the past, you know, regarding the bride of Messiah. Um, you know, the authority that Elohim will grant her, the favour that Elohim will grant her. And rather than deal with the more ethereal, spiritual aspect of it, I actually want to make it a lot more practical because once something is practical, it means you can put it into action and you actually have something to do. Uh, and Hebraic thought is here and do. Um, quite often, you know, I've noticed this... Um, the way uh, I've noticed about myself, and it took my wife to expose it in me actually, that I'm very much a person that once I understand a spiritual concept, I don't need to be told how to do it. Like I just, it just kind of happens. I understand it, it happens. And I don't have to sit there breaking it down. And my, my wife would say, I get you, Michael, but tell me how to do it. I'm like, well, you just kind of do it, right? It happens. And this is when I realised that not everyone's like me. And this is the beauty of Yah's creation and its variety. Um, and so I want, you know, I, I get this semi-regularly. I hear it in the Q&As or I, I see it in the chatter. Like, I understand you, Michael, but what do I do about it? And so hopefully today is going to be one of these, what do you do? Or what to expect at the very least. Um, before we dive in, let's do a very quick recap of what we covered last week, which was Elohim as friend. Okay. Friend of the king was actually a title and position of authority in the ancient Near Eastern world. And we saw that it's definitely not what it means today. It was a very honoured position. It was a trusted position, one that had been tested over time. And again, we use the term friend uh, way too casually today as compared to how it was used in scripture. And we made a distinction between the friend of the king not being the bride. Because especially in ancient times, and we saw several examples of this in the scriptures last week, the, the friend of the king was generally an advisor to the king. He was part of the kingly and royal court, but clearly... The friend was not the bride. Um, a friend of the king can draw near to the king and see the face of the king. Um, and again, in ancient terms, uh, well, sorry, let me rephrase that. In modern terms, we forget the protocols that would have been needed to actually draw near to the king. You couldn't just rock on up. You would have to bring a gift, generally, which is where the word korban comes in from, which is what would have been your sacrifice. And there would have been strict protocol to be able to draw near. Now, the friend of the king could, could just go in and see the king face to face, which should make us think of someone like Moshe, who Elohim spoke to with face to face. Those who draw near will guard the Moedim and the covenant. And we used Isaiah 56 for this. That there will be strangers as well. <clears throat> that these foreigners, not only that they're the seed of the house of Israel, but the, the, those that cling to the covenant, those that will guard the Sabbaths and that will set these things apart, that will learn to love the name of Elohim, so the authority of Elohim. These will be given a name better than that of sons. So it's linked to the foreigners being gathered in with the house of Israel. Uh, so we know that there's going to be the regathering of the house of Israel, but we also know, as Yeshua said, there are other sheep from another fold that I am yet to bring in. And he was referencing some of the uh, prophets there, namely Isaiah and Ezekiel. <coughs> being known by Elohim. So not knowing of Elohim, like a lot of people know about Elohim, but do they know him on the intimate level? And this 
love is a two-way stream. So does Elohim know you? And I know it sounds like a silly question. Of course he knows me. He knows everything about me. He knows the hair on my head and everything, but at the intimate level. You know, this is where Paul would say, um, oh, you know, I, I, but right now I see dimly or I see in part, but then I will see fully and then I will be known as I have been known. I believe there's this aspect of knowing someone, that it's love language, essentially, intimacy language. Knowing wisdom will guard us from the strange woman, spiritual harlotry, mystery Babylon. Um, but again, not knowing about wisdom, knowing it at the intimate level. And to know something at the intimate level implies that it's written on your heart, which means you've been doing it and practicing it, and thus it becomes second nature to you. That is what will guard you from spiritual adultery in religious seduction. The story of Ruth, the Moabitess. When she went to approach Boaz, she bathed herself. So think the washing of the water by the water of the word. She anointed herself. So think the oil that comes from the crushing of our lives. And she put on garments. Again, think the linen bridal garments. And she did all these things just to be able to draw near to Boaz. Now, Boaz was the relative of Naomi, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law. But the word in the Hebrew there for relative it was actually better known as someone, a known one. He's known. He, like, again, this intimate knowing. Dwelling with Elohim. So I don't know if you guys remember, but drawing near, knowing, uh, dwelling with, which was also linked to being a neighbour. All these words were kind of in the semantic backdrop of being a friend of Elohim. But then that should bring up, the, you know, who does dwell in your set apart, in your set apart mountain, O oh Yah? And then it gives you the qualifiers. So what does it mean to dwell with Elohim? The word in the Hebrew there would be Shechan, which is where the word Mishkan, the dwelling place of Elohim, comes from. Dwelling next to a neighbour. So the word neighbour here, this Shechen, comes from the word Shechan, which means to dwell with. Now, um, I'm pulling this point actually from the Passover instructions. Uh, to dwell next to your neighbour. The word next, karov, means, it comes from the word karav, which means to draw near. So dwelling next to, drawing near, bring in a sacrifice, a korban. These are all part of this same word family. And again, who shall dwell in the mountain of Elohim? A friend of the king will have grace poured on his lips or favour. And then we saw that actually this is a description of Psalm 45. Uh, it was spe it's speaking of King David in the psalm, but we know it's a, a messianic psalm as well because it's quoted by the book of Hebrews. But Proverbs says that one who has um, literally gracious lips or gracious speech uh, will be a friend of the king. A friend should be a man of peace. So we saw that the, the, there's this um, idiomatic expression in the Hebrew, ish shlomi, literally the man of my peace. And we saw that Jeremiah had been, uh, his men of peace had done a number on him. They turned against him. Um, and this was, I believe the, the Tanakh backdrop for Yeshua's words when he sent out his disciples two by two, right? Go to a house and say, peace unto you, shalom unto you. It would be literally shalom aleichem that they would be saying. And then Yeshua says, if there's a son of peace in the house, then stay there. And I believe it's this phrase, this idiomatic expression that would have been fairly common back then. Discipleship should lead to biblical friendship, a trusted and tested position. And the scriptures I was drawing from on that was Yeshua saying to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Because you now know I have given you all that my father has told, uh, told me. And a friend knows, sorry, 
a, a servant does not know what the master is doing, but you, you now know. I have told you everything. And we see that, so for, even by the pattern given to us by our Messiah, biblical friendship was tested. Remember that Messiah had spent however long you want to believe his ministry was uh, with his disciples. And it was once they'd gone through that process of being challenged, of Messiah literally laying hands on them, that's what led to friendship. So it's not earned, but you have to, this is, Curtis quite often says that trust is learnt. Well, how do you learn it? Time and observation. The companion friend of the groom, we saw, so the word um, re'e or re'a could be used as the friend of the groom. So the friend of the groom was the one who would pass the messages between the groom and the bride-to-be. And we see this language used in, um, in Judges with Samson. And we also saw like the feminine equivalent, the word raya, is similar to the word ba'al. And the way it's similar it's, is the wide semantic meaning or range of the word. So ba'al could mean a lord or master or owner in terms of authority, but it can also mean husband. And in the same word, raya can mean close female companion. It can also mean uh, bride. And this is used in Song of Songs. So you see again this overlap going from friend to bride. And that was my own phone. Look at the hypocrisy from coming from the stage. <laughs> Yes, that's on the recording. I'm leaving it on as well. <laughs> Abraham, Moshe and David clearly were friends of the groom. And we, you know the phrase that says David had a heart after Elohim's heart. Well, the Hebrew doesn't say that. It says as Elohim's heart. The, Yah wanted a, someone, a king that had a heart as his own, which is, I know, Michael, you're splitting hairs. I like these little nuances. We're actually going to look predominantly at Moshe and David today because I believe there are templates for going from friend to bridal level. So here we are at part four. Uh, and as we've gone through the different parts, hopefully people have noticed that actually as you mature, more trust is given, more authority is given until eventually you can fully serve and the king doesn't even have to worry, oh, what are they going to do? It's full trust, granted full authority. So let's look, we're going to start with Moshe first. Let's start with Moshe. Because we know that Yah spoke with Moshe face to, face to face as a friend. So that, and by this stage, Moshe is already serving. He's over the house of Israel, so to speak, leading them through the wilderness. So at what point does Moshe transition from uh, a friend of the groom to bridal level? Yah said to Moshe, so this is right after the golden calf, by the way. So we're in, we're right at the beginning of the Exodus account. Right at the beginning, Moshe's gone up for 40 days the first time. And we know what happened, uh, wild parties and orgies around the golden calf. And Yah says to Moshe, go get down for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Mitzrayim have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a moulded calf and have bowed themselves to it and slaughtered to it and said, this is your mighty one, O Yisrael, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. Who led the Israelites out of Egypt? It was Yah. So what's Yah saying to Moshe, the Israelites, that you have led out of Mitzrayim? Always in the infancy of my journey, the way I used to read this was that Yah was having a bad day and he, he, he didn't want to take accountability for what he did. It's essentially what I was saying. Oh, the people, you brought them. You know, much like 
parents bickering, saying, your son, and the other spouse is going, he's your son too, you know. But I don't believe this is what's going on. Could it be that Elohim is seeing if Moshe is going to take the glory? The people you've brought out. And Moshe could have gone, yeah, I did bring them out. I did part the Red Sea. I actually believe this is the way we ought to be reading it. And as we go through, you'll see why. Yah said to Moshe, I have seen this people and see it is a stiff-necked people. And now let me alone that my wrath might burn against them and I consume them and I make of you a great nation. So he's giving Moshe an opportunity here. Now, let me ask you this. Had this truly occurred, would this have nullified the promise to Abraham? No, it wouldn't. Because the promise to Abraham was that your seed shall be as numerous as the stars of heaven. Moshe is still the seed of Abraham, technically. So right here, Mo Yah is saying, how about it, Moshe? I make you, say, the next Noah, the next Abraham. Through you alone, your, the, 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 my plan of redemption will come. And he would have, Yah would have not been in breach of the promise to Abraham. But Moshe pleaded with Yah his Elohim and said, Yah, why does your wrath burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Mitzrayim with great power and with a strong hand? Why should the Mitzrites, look at where he goes. He doesn't even go, oh Yah, what, what, what about Abraham, what about this? He says, what if the Egyptians, the Mitzrites, speak and say, for evil he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from the heat of your wrath and relent from this evil to your people. Remember Avraham, Yitzchak and Yisrael, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I increase your seed like the stars of the heavens. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So, <coughs> again, with even if Moshe had become the next progenitor, that promise would still stand. But look at where Moshe goes first. What, what the Egyptians will say. So what's Moshe really thinking about here? Yah's name, his, his reputation. Now, you got to understand, in the ancient mindset, the majority of the pagan gods were very capricious and they needed placating often, hence the blood sacrifice and da 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 da. This is where Yah Elohim of Yisrael was extremely different. He didn't need placating, there was actually mercy, compassion shown. So I believe what at Moses is actually saying here is more than just guarding the honour and authority, uh, the reputation of Elohim. It's more about Elohim, you're to be different than all the other pagan gods in the, or around. And if you smoke the Israelites and say goodbye, what are the nations going to say? That the God of Israel is just like all the other gods. Thus, Yah Elohim of Israel would not be set apart and different. So this is what Moshe is truly guarding. It goes beyond reputation. And Yah relented from the evil which he said he would do to his people. And it came to be on the next day that Moshe said to the people, so Moshe comes down, deals with Aaron. You know, Aaron does this whole thing. Oh, just threw the gold in and out it came, you know. <laughs> So all that's happened, uh, Moshe has smashed the tablets, the first tablets of the covenant that Elohim had written, came to be on the next day that Moshe said to the people, you, you have sinned a great sin and now I am going up to Yah if I might atone for your sin. So not only does he intercede for the people, he now actually goes to try and intercede on behalf of them. He goes one step further. He doesn't just stop the action of Israel being destroyed. He does that and then he tries to bring Israel back into a position of favour with Elohim. 
So again, he's going above and beyond. It's not just, ah, oh, oh, I saved your backsides today. Not only that, I'm now going to bring you back into good standing with Elohim, or I'm going to attempt. Emotion, so, so you're actually seeing restitution here. And Moshe is the one trying to carry this out, even though technically none of it is his responsibility. Moshe returned to Yah and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made for themselves a mighty one of gold. And now, if you would forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book, which you have written. So Moshe is literally saying, if you won't forgive these people, bring the second and final death upon me. He's willing to die eternally because th this is having your name blotted out of the book of life talk here. Now, why would Moshe, like is he suffering from a, a, a bit of false humility here? Is he just trying to uh, butter Elohim up with his words? No. I believe that Moshe is saying, if you're going to blot these people, if you're going to deal with these people, then you need to blot me out too. Why? Because I'm no better. I, if I was to be in their shoes, would I have done the same thing? I believe Moshe knew that he was no better. He was just more mature than them. He did know better. But you've got to remember that Moshe used to be pretty much an Egyptian. And it took 40 years of being a shepherd to get that Egypt out of him before he could be used. So Moshe is not thinking of himself more highly than he ought. So you see many things here being tested in Moshe. Is, is he going to guard the honour and reputation of Elohim? Not only to the people, but to all the nations around. Is he going to allow pride to get in? And is he going to hold himself above everybody else, despite the fact that Yah has favoured him? Yah said to Moshe, whoever has sinned against me, I blot him out of my book. So these would be the ones. This implies that these people knew better, by the way. And now go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. See, my messenger goes before you, and in the day of my visitation, I shall visit their sin upon them. And so Yah plagued the people because they made the calf which Aharon had made. So this is happening literally... Um, right off the heels of the spring Moedim. Like, you, you're, you're talking uh, just after Shavuot here. Remember that the, the Ten Commandments and all that is associated with Shavuot? And so this is arguably 40 days after. So you're talking that period of time, you know, uh, early onset of summer. But this is right at the beginning of the Exodus. So bear that in mind. Numbers 14, fast forward a year. So Numbers 14, uh, the 10 spies have just gone out and they've given, the 12 spies, sorry, 10 of them give the slanderous report. We've covered this a week or so ago. But I believe that you see Moshe being tested again here. Obviously the people were tested, they failed the test. Yah says to Moshe, how long shall I be scorned by these people? How long shall I not be trusted by them with all the signs which I have done in their midst? Let me strike them with pestilence and disinherit them and make of you a greater nation, greater and mightier than they. Yah is putting the same offer on the table again. Let me destroy them. Let me start with you. Now, Remember, a whole year has gone past. Have things gone splendidly well for Moshe during that year? No, far from it. The people nearly killed him several times. And every single time he interceded for them. So now, not only is Moshe being tested in everything we've j just already covered, but he's now testing Moshe's long-suffering and patience with his people. And Moshe said to Yah, then the Mitzrites, the Egyptians, shall hear it. For by your power, you brought these people up from their midst. He's still in the same place. 
And they shall say to the inhabitants of this land, they have heard that you, Yah, are in the midst of these people, that you, Yah, are seen eye to eye, and that your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a column of cloud by day and in a column of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your report shall speak, saying... Because Yah was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to them, therefore he slew them in the wilderness. But remember that the Abrahamic covenant would still be intact, even if Yah had reset with Moshe. But this was all about honour and reputation. And to set Yah apart from all the other gods of the nations. Remember that in the Exodus account, all the plagues were there to bring the gods of Egypt to nothing. Because with every plague, Yah was dealing with a particular god of Egypt. And now I pray, let the power of Yah be great as you have spoken, saying, look, look this is what makes Yah great. Yah is patient and of great love and commitment, forgiving crookedness and transgression, but by no means leaving unpunished. Visiting the crookedness of the father on the children to the third and fourth generation. So this is actually what, not the miracles. Like the miracles are powerful, don't get me wrong. But it's actually Yah's patience and great loving commitment, his forgiveness. This is what makes him powerful, from all, more powerful than all the other gods. And if we're to be like our father in heaven... Please forgive the crookedness of this people according to the greatness of your loving commitment as you have forgiven this people from Mitzrayim even until now. And Yah said, I shall forgive according to your word. But truly as I live and all the earth is filled with the esteem of Yah, for none of these men who have seen my esteem and the signs which I did in Mitzrayim and in the wilderness and have tried me now these ten times and have disobeyed my voice, shall see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor any of those who scorned me see it. So there's forgiveness, but he's not leaving unpunished. And this is what we're seeing here. And we see that the children of the first generation suffered because of it. Because they now had to grow up in the wilderness, did they not? It was everyone from the age of 20, uh, 20 and above that died which means all the children through to teenagers survived. Well, imagine being, I don't know, 19 at the time, thinking, yes, we're all about to go in, boom, you've got to now do 40 years in the wilderness because of what your old man did. So this is how you see the, the sins being passed on to the third and fourth generation. It's not that you are smiting the kids uh, for what their parents did, it's that Actions have consequences and they affect other people than you. But my servant Kalev, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me completely, I shall bring into the land where he went and his seed shall inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are dwelling by the valley, turn back tomorrow and set out into the wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds. So Moshe is already at the friend level at this time. He is the friend of the king. He's allowed to draw near. He's allowed to see his face. And I say this in inverted commas because we know that he didn't see the literal face. But then in the Torah, it does say that Yah spoke to him face to face as a friend. So we see Moshe, even at this trusted in a court level, being tested. Which means that no one is above the testing of Elohim. Not even Michael the archangel is above being tested. We see this account in the book of Jude. Even Michael was tested. If Moshe will be tested, well, guess what's coming for us? <laughs> Number 16, the Korah incident. We always like to focus on Korah and what Korah did wrong and what Reuben did wrong and, you know, all the things that happened. But we forget, was it just Korah being tested? Or was Moshe and Aaron being tested too at the same time? 
You know, when Yeshua was in the Garden of Gethsemane, going through his crushing, what does he say? You pray to Peter, James and John. You pray lest you fall into trial. So, yeah. Korah assembled these, all the congregation against them at the door of the tent of appointment and the esteem of Yah appeared to all the congregation. Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon saying, separate yourselves from the midst of this congregation. Let me consume them in a moment. Same offer back on the table. Think about it. I'm going to consume this congregation. Who's left? Aaron, Moses, probably the Levites. But they fell on their faces and said, O Elohim of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, are you wroth with all the congregation? So, so Moshe is, I believe he's being tested. Are you going to forego justice and right ruling for self-gain? Are you going to bring that self-gain to yourself by twisting the promises of Elohim? Because Moshe could have easily gone, well, technically... The promise to Abraham is still on, on the cards. It just happens to be through me. I believe Moshe's integrity is being tested here. Yah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the congregation, saying, move away from around the tents of Korach, Dathan and Aviram. So Moshe rose up, went to Dathan and Aviram and the elders of Israel followed him. What's Moshe being tested there for? Are you going to dish out the necessary discipline? Knowing that the people aren't going to like you for it. Who do you fear more, Moshe? Me or them? We never see this as Moshe being tested. Remember, Korah was Moshe's first cousin. Are you going to love your cousin more than me, Moshe? Are you going to let your um, forgiveness and mercy get the best of you? Curtis often says that our greatest strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. One of my strengths is that I like to see the best in people. That can be my greatest weakness as well, by allowing things to go on longer than they ought to. Because I think, ah, oh, but. And I believe this is what Moshe is being tested in here. He spoke of the congregation saying, please turn away from the tents of these wrong men. Do not touch whatever belongs to them, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So now Moshe is actually acting in the office of prophet here, like giving out the message of Elohim. But all the congregation of the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and Aharon. So this is, okay, next day, Korah, dead. You know, all the ground has swallowed everything up. And this happens, the congregation of the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and against Aharon, saying, you, you have killed the people of Yah. And it came to be when the congregation assembled against Moshe and against Aharon, that they turned toward the tent of appointment and see the cloud covered it and the esteem of Yah appeared. Moshe and Aharon came before the tent of appointment and Yah spoke to Moshe saying, Arise from amidst this congregation and let me consume them in a moment. Again, Yah keeps putting that offer back on the table. Moshe, let me make you great. Let me make you great, Moshe. And instead they fell on their faces. Turns out that Aaron may have learned quite a few lessons actually by this stage. Because notice it's both of them that are interceding. So Moshe said to Aharon, take the fire holder and put fire in it from the... Right, people are now dying. A plague, the plague's going out. People are dropping down dead. Moshe says to Aaron, take the fire holder and put fire in it from the slaughter place. Lay incense on so Go hurry to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from Yah. The plague has begun. Yet again, Moshe is not just interceding for them, but he's trying to actually bring the congregation to some sort of right standing with Elohim. He's going above and beyond. 
And Aaron took as Moshe commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, saw the plague had begun moving for the people. And he laid on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stopped. There's a huge messianic illusion here of Messiah being our high priest here. Because it's Aaron that, you know, with the incense, that's, and he's literally standing between the dead and the living. And those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died on account of Korah. So those would be the 250 or 200 elders uh, that were waving the incense. So basically, almost 15,000 people died that day. Then Aaron returned to Moshe at the door of the tent of appointment for the plague had stopped. So I see several things that Moshe has been tested on. Guarding the name or reputation of Elohim, setting Yah apart, not allowing pride to get in the way and to allow that pride to twist the promises of Elohim to self-gain. And then not only that, but being willing to be the mouth of Elohim and be willing to give out the discipline that is required. So you're seeing Moshe embody essentially what Elohim says, that he is forgiving, long-suffering, patient, loving commitment, but not allowing those who sin to go unpunished. However, Mo, even Moshe dropped the ball once. Numbers 20. The children of Israel and all the congregation came into the wilderness of Tzin in the first new moon and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried. Now there was no water for the congregation and they assembled against Moshe and against Aharon. And the people contended with Moshe and spoke, saying, If only we had died with our brothers, died before, when our brothers died before Yah. So the same thing is going on. Why have you brought up the assembly of Yah into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? And why have you brought, up, brought us up out of Mitzrayim to bring us to this evil place? Not a plain of place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moshe and Aharon went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of appointment, and they fell on their faces, and the esteem of Yah appeared to them. So again, they're in the place of intercession. And Yah spoke to Moshe saying, take the rod, assemble the congregation. So this is the rod of Aaron that would have budded, um, that was, would have been placed in the Holy of Holies. You and your brother Aharon, and you shall speak to the rock before they rise, and it shall give its water. And you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give the congregation and the, uh, give drink to the congregation and their livestock. And Moshe took the rod from before Yah as he commanded him. And Moshe and Aharon assembled the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And then Moshe lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And much water came out and the congregation, their livestock, drank. Everyone focuses that Moshe struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And they're saying, see, he, he disobeyed Elohim and had he spoken to the rock, you would have had this perfect type and shadow of the rock being Messiah, struck the first time, spoken to the second time, la da 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 forgetting that Moshe, in verse 10, has stolen the glory of Elohim. And there's the issue. Here now, you rebels, they were rebels, so Moshe is entitled to call them rebels. Shall we, myself and Aaron, bring water for you out of this rock? And there's the thing that everyone misses. Because now Moshe is, is doing something in his own strength. You've got to remember that he did strike the rock before. Well, that worked. But I don't think that he's going... I think he was just frustrated. You know when Yeshua, the, the disciples ask Yeshua, explain this parable to us. And um, Yeshua says, are you still without understanding? And the word 
without understanding in the Greek is asunetos, which means, are you being stupid? He's actually saying, like, are you being moronic? And you see Yeshua say something along the lines of, how long must I stay around? How long must I be with you people? I believe Moshe got to that place and then went too far. Made it about him and stole Elohim's glory. What gives it away is if you read on. Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, because you did not believe me to set me apart in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore you do not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Yah's telling him, you've stolen my glory. You took the glory for bringing water out the rock and it was me that was to give the water. So again, it's this thing of guarding, guarding the... Uh, honour of, but I actually believe you're seeing the picture of a bride usurp her husband here. These were the waters of Merivah, because the children of Yisrael contended with Yah, and he was set apart among them. So, now we know that Moshe did not, that did not disqualify him from, you know, being the bride of Messiah. Uh, but again, as Yah says, I, I do not leave unpunished. Moshe knew better. He had to undergo the consequences of his actions here in this life. Personally, I believe Moshe is one of the 24 elders. So, whole of the line of thinking there. So I do not believe that Moshe got disqualified for this act. And... I guess I want this to be an encouragement because people self-condemnation, they do something wrong and they go, oh, that's it, Elohim's done with me. He wasn't done with Moshe to the point that Yah would show up to Moshe's funeral. It says that Yah buried him. No one knows where he's buried. And then you see Michael and Satan in the book of Jude fighting over the body of Moshe. So Yah... It, it, Point being, Moshe was not disqualified. But it turns out he still needed a lesson. Are people seeing where Moshe was tested? Let's look at King David. And Abigail, my father is joy, Abigail, saw David and she hastened to come down from the donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. So we know... Abigail's husband, uh, Nabal or Naval in the Hebrew, uh, which means fool, um, basically spurned David. And David got very angry and he's like, right, I'm going down to Nabal's house. I'm going to kill all the males. And Abigail catches wind of this and she goes to intercede as we're going to see. Think of... You're going to see a beautiful picture of Abigail becoming the bride, but also look at where David has been tested. And you're actually going to see that David had failed this test and it took someone to intercede on or to stop him in his tracks. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my master, let this crookedness be on me. So she understands that she's one flesh with Nabal. And please let your female servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your female servant. Please let not my master regard this man of Belial, Naval, for his, as his name is, so is he. Naval is his name and folly is with him. Naval just means fool. But I, your female servant, did not see the young men of my master whom you sent. And now my master, as Yah lives and as your being lives, since Yah has withheld you from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand. Now then, let your enemies be as Naval, even those seeking Elohim again, seeking evil against my master. In modern terms, Abigail is saying, up until now, you've not had to take matters into your own hands. And the word of that has gotten around. Elohim has dealt. You've allowed Elohim to be your, your vengeance. And now this present, which your female servant has brought to my master, let it be given to the young men who follow my master. 
Please forgive the, the transgression of your female servant, for Yah is certainly making a steadfast house for my master, because my master fights the battles of Yah, and evil is not found in you all your days. Essentially, Abigail is saying, David, if you're going to go do this, you're going to have evil found in your house now. She's guarding the honour of David. Remember that at this time, all of the kingdom knows who Samuel anointed to be king, but David is simply waiting for that day to be inaugurated. Saul's after him. He's still, he's still not killing Saul. Think of the witness that gave to the people of Israel. And if a man rises to pursue you and seek your life, and the life of my master has been bound in the bundle of the living with Yah your Elohim, then the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall be when Yah has done for my master according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, i.e. to be the king, and has commanded you to be ruler over Israel, do not let this be a staggering and a stumbling of heart to my master that you have shed blood without cause or that my master has saved himself. And when Yah has done good to my master, then remember your female servant. Abigail could see what was going on. David, you're about to take matters into your own hands. She knew he was, that David was going to be the future king, which shows she has faith in Elohim and the prophets of Elohim. So she understands authority on that front. She understands marriage and design on that front because, okay, she's calling her husband out, but she's still remaining submitted to him. When you read the whole story, she's allowing, she's the picture perfect uh, example of what Peter says, wives submit to your husbands and win them over with your good behavior, even if they're disobedient to the word. So that by your good behaviour, you, um, that, that you may win them over. Abigail is your template for this. David's about to take matters into his own hands and she's interceding on David's behalf. What is Elohim looking for? David said to Abigail, Blessed be Yah Elohim of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today, Blessed is your good taste and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. This is all about taking matters into your own hands. This is what this, event, uh, this story is all about. Nevertheless, as Yah Elohim of Israel lives, who has kept me back from doing evil to you, if you had not hurried and come to meet me, not a male would have been left in the vial by break of day for certain. So we, yeah, and David received from her hand what she had brought from him and said to her, go in peace to your house. See, I have listened to your voice and I have accepted your face. This, I believe this would have been a, a statement of now that her face has been accepted, she can now come before David at any point because her face is acceptable. David heard, so we know that um, the Baal or Naval gets really drunk that night. Uh, Abigail doesn't say anything. She waits for Naval to sober up a little bit. Uh, she tells him what has happened and then he becomes like stone for about 10 days, I think, and then he dies. And David heard that Naval was dead and he said, Blessed be Yah who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Naval and has kept his servant from evil. For Yah has returned the evil of Naval on his own head. And, Naval, and David spoke, sent and spoke to Abigail and, to take her as his wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask to become his wife. And she arose, bowed her face to the earth and said, here is your female servant, a servant to wash the feet of, my, of the servants of my master. This was the lowest position of a servant, the one who used to wash feet. And so you should be thinking of all the things that Yeshua said and did. If I, being your master, wash your feet, then you should humble yourselves to each other and do unto each other. 
as Yeshua says in the parable, when you go to sit at the table, sit down the bottom so that you can then be brought higher rather than sitting at the top and being told to move down. And Abigail hurried and rose. She didn't kick around and go, oh, I'll take a leisurely stroll. She hurried and rose and rode on a donkey with five of her female attendants or maidens. And she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. I wonder if this is an allusion to the five wise virgins. If you look at the word female attendant, it would have been, uh, the King James, I think, calls it damsel. It's a young it's a young girl from late teens onwards. So David got tested. Are you going to take matters into your own hands? He was going to. And Yah sent someone to intercede on his behalf. David is now king. He's king of Israel. In fact, he's a king over both north and south. And Satan stood up against Yisrael and moved David to number Yisrael. Famous story, the word suit there, to move, it actually means to incite, to allure, to lure, to seduce. So you get actually this... Uh, Think of the strange woman who flatters you with her words. There's this thing of, there's an inference to spiritual adultery here. By the way, just as a little tidbit, the word Satan there in the English is capitalised. In the Hebrew it just says an adversary. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Satan, because there's no, there's no the in the art, it just says, and a Satan, an adversary. So, yeah, do with that what you will. It was evil in the eyes of Elohim concerning this matter, and he struck Yisrael. Then David said to Elohim, I have sinned greatly because I have done this matter. But now I pray, take away the crookedness of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Yah spoke to God, David's seer, saying, Go and you shall speak to David, saying, Thus said Yah, I hold three options before you. Choose one of them for yourself, and I do it to you. So, how did this all start? David decided to count the people. He took matters into his own hands. And now Elohim is saying, make a choice for yourself. I find that interesting. So God came to David and said to him, Thus said Yah, choose for yourself either three years of scarcity of food or three new moons or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you or else three days of the sword of Yah, even the plague in the land with the messenger of Yah destroying throughout all the borders of Yisrael. And now consider what I am, what answer I am to return to him who sent me. David said to God, I am in great trouble. Please let me fall into the hand of Yah, for his compassion is very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. I used to think that David had chosen the plague of the land, but David doesn't make a choice. He just says, don't let me fall into the hand of man, which takes away being defeated by the foes. But now David's two choices are scarcity of food or plague, which are both in the, in the domain of Elohim. And I realized when revisiting this that David never made a choice. This all started with David taking matters into his own hands. He decided to count the people. And now Yah is saying, choose for yourself, David. Do you see what Yah is doing? Just in the, in the, he's being tested. And David is realising, no, -uh. when I make choices by myself, bad stuff happens. Let me fall into the hand of Allah. He's literally saying, Yah, you deal with me. So at least that cancels three days of sword. But, I mean, you could even argue, though, that 
When you look at the blessings of curses, the blessings is you will put to flight one to a thousand. The curses is the, is the reverse, which implies there's a supernatural element even to that. I believe David realised, I'm not going to make the choice. You choose, Elohim. You choose. This is what got me in the trouble in the first place. I'd never spotted that. Yah sent the plague, a plague, upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And Elohim sent a messenger to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, Yah saw and relented about the evil and said to the messenger who was destroying, Enough, now stop your hand. And the messenger of Yah was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. The Jebusite. David lifted his eyes and saw the messenger of Yah standing between earth and the heavens, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders wrapped in sackcloth fell on their faces. Which means that the elders, it implies the elders saw this messenger too. David said to Elohim, was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these, the sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Yahweh Elohim, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people to be plagued. So... David is saying, make a, he's given the, the option, choose for yourself one of these three things. David says, no Elohim, you choose. You make the decision for me. Elohim decides to smite the people. David could have very easily gone, you know what? Wow, I got away with that one. Elohim, who am I to argue with Elohim? Elohim has chosen, his will has been done. But he didn't. He realised, no, I'm the one that did this. They should not suffer for my sake. This is the same mentality that Moshe had, especially with the Korah incident. He said, should the whole assembly suffer because of one man? David realised he was that one man. But what people miss... The people are being plagued. And David's saying, let this be against me, what? To be plagued. This is going to pl keep that to the back of your mind. The messenger of Yah commanded God to say to David that David should go up to raise a slaughter place to Yah on the threshing floor of Orn and the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of God, which he had spoken in the name of Yah. And Ornan turned and saw the messenger, and his four sons with him hid themselves, and Ornan was threshing wheat. So you see this picture of Ornan, um, the threshing floor, separating the wheat from the chaff. And this whole thing of David being tested, and I believe this was arguably the test that got him from friend to bridal level. David came to Ornan and Ornan looked and saw David and he went out from the threshing floor and bowed down to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, give me the site of the threshing floor so that I build a slaughter place to Yah on it. Give it to me at the complete price so that the plague is restrained from the people. So David's not even asking for mate's rates or I'm the king. Ornan said to David, take it for yourself and let my master, the sovereign, do what is good in his eyes. See, I shall give you the cattle for the ascending offerings, the threshing implements for wood and the wheat and the grain offering. I give it all. So again, David is being tested, I believe here. No, have it for free, have it for free. Sovereign David said to Ornan, no, but I shall certainly buy it at the complete price, for I do not take what is yours for Yah, nor offer an ascending offering without cost. So again, David's integrity is being tested in this. He could have easily gone, oh wow, Yah has provided. Awesome. I'm going to take it at face value. How often have we had something good? I guess... 
How often have we willingly blinded ourselves because some, the way a certain series of events has gone has actually benefited us and we go, okay, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm not going to ask further. Or do we actually sit and think about what's going on? David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. In today's money, this is the equivalent of millions, by the way. I, I forget the exact figure, but you can crunch the numbers by working out how much a day's, or a day's wages was um, a Roman denarius, five denarius was a shekel. And you, so a denarius was five days' wages thereabouts. So you can kind of work it out. And one shekel, one shekel of gold was 10 shekels of silver. Do the math. You're dealing with millions worth here. David built there the slaughter place to Yah and offered ascending offerings and peace offerings and called on Yah. And he answered him from the heavens by fire on the slaughter place of the ascending offering. So literally fire came down from heaven. This would then become the site where the temple would be built by Solomon. Then Yah commanded the messenger and he returned the sword to its sheath. So remember this as well. David has bought this place. He's been answered by fire. So David knows full well, Yah has accepted my offering. And, he's, and now we know the, the messenger has returned its sword. So there's no more a threat to the people. At that time, when David saw that Yah had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan and the Yebusite, he slaughtered there. For the dwelling place of Yah and the slaughter place of the ascending offering, which Moshe had made in the wilderness, were at that time in the high place in Gibbon. But David was unable to go before it to inquire of Elohim, for he was afraid of the sword of the messenger of Yah. So, we read here that David didn't want to go to the tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moshe. Whenever he wanted to offer sacrifice, he went to this place, which would, and this place would become the future temple. Why is David afraid of the sword of the messenger? Because the messenger has put the sword back in its place. I said, keep this in the back of your mind. Let your hand, I pray, Yah, my Elohim, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people to be plagued. To be plagued. The plague went from the people to David. So the only thing I can think of that, and remember, the, the messenger has put the, the sword back in its sheath. So why would David be afraid to go to the tabernacle? My personal, like Curtis and I realised this when we were doing the message to the bridegroom series, but what if David actually took the plague upon himself, which made him Levitically unclean, which is why he would be afraid to go to the tabernacle. That's the only, the only reason you could not go to the tabernacle is if you were Levitically unclean. I believe this may have been why he was afraid of the sword of the messenger. He couldn't go there anymore if he was to obey the laws of Torah. So I believe here you just, there's so many things here. Um, but for the sake of today, you're seeing David understand justice, right ruling, willing to put himself on the line, being willing to accept accountability, responsibility and consequence. And... By doing all of this, I actually believe he was guarding the reputation of Elohim. Why should the people suffer because of what David did? And I believe David did the same thing that Moshe did. Put himself on the line, guarded the uh, honour of Elohim and was willing to take a plague upon himself. And again, huge messianic illusions here of Messiah wanting to take the sins upon himself. So that's David. I believe. Let's look at Peter. 
When therefore, they, I, I, I quote this passage every so often. When therefore they had eaten breakfast, Yeshua said to Shimon Kephar, so this is Peter, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you agape me more than these? He said, yes, master, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Agape is the most intimate form of love. Phileo is a notch beneath it. It's slightly less intimate. Agape can happen between it's, it can happen between husband and wife, obviously, but it can also happen um, at the brotherly or sisterly level. And I mean brothers and sisters in the faith here. But phileo is friendship. Think Elohim as friend, Elohim as bridegroom, phileo agape as a nice equivalent. Peter was at the friend level at this stage. Because remember at the friend level, this is when you can start being entrusted to serve. And, and Peter was about to go and do just that. He said to him, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you agape o me? And he said to him, yes, master, you know that I phileo you. And he said, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you love me? Do you phileo me? So now Yeshua is asking, he's not asking, do you agape me? But do you phileo? Kepha was sad because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Master, you know all, you know that I phileo you. Yeshua said to him, feed my sheep. Peter was sad because he realised Yeshua called him out. Peter, after everything that has just occurred, you know, Peter betrays him. He sees Yeshua after the resurrection. All of these things. Peter is still not in a place of agape. And so here, I believe, you've heard me say this before, Yeshua is giving Peter the means by which to go from phileo to agape. Serve. Serve. Serve his people. Look, I'll use myself as the example, and I'll be a bit honest. Um, my love for the body of Messiah has grown an awful lot more in the seven years, wow, that I've been serving in this fellowship in the wider community. I went to a play, well, look, I'll be honest, I, when I first started, it was, yeah, I want to help everybody. Good intentions, full of zeal, fresh off the press, so to speak. Then the body starts to do your head in with all the whinging and the problems they bring and da 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 and you just start, oh, and now, and then you go to a place of pity and going, oh, because you can start to see the brokenness and then you actually just go to this place of grieving for them. And actually that, come, and then to a place of love. And I've had to go through these stages. I believe it's a form of this. Because here's the thing, if you can't love that which, he's, what, that which he has died for, namely his people, do you really love him? And I believe this is what Moshe understood. These are Elohim's people. I'm just a servant. And as Paul would say, don't judge another servant because to his own master he shall stand or fall. But there's something about serving others that teaches you agape. It's amazing how Yah's ways completely, they, they, they do everything to move you away from self. All of that how does this relate to... I'll try to blitz through this fairly quickly. Um, <laughs> he says, pausing. Um, so far we've seen... I personally believe that the main thing Elohim is looking for from these examples is someone that will guard his honour. Someone that will guard his name. Or as the ten words say, do not take the name of Yah in vain. And what that truly actually means. That it's not to do with, you know, using the name in a, in a, as an expletive, though you probably shouldn't do that either, out of respect. 
But this is about how, what the witness that we give. With all of that being said, <clears throat> First Timothy, First Timothy three, verse one: Trustworthy is the word. <clears throat> If a man longs for the position of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then should be blameless. Blameless to who? The husband of one wife. Imagine if I had six wives. What kind of message would that send? Sober. By the way, the word sober there goes beyond just glug, 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 or lack thereof. It means to be sober-minded as well. Sensible, orderly, kind to strangers. It's amazing how all of these have to do with witness and the light that you shed or lack thereof. Not given to wine. Is it just yourself that you make yourself a fool of? Or do you, make yourself, do you make a fool of yourself in front of a group of people when you drink too much? No brawler, but gentle, not quarrelsome, no lover of silver. One who rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all reverence. Parents will understand that one when their kids play up and they're like, you're bringing shame to me. The other parents are judging me. All, a lot of these are to do with witness. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house well, how shall he look after the assembly of Elohim? Not a new convert, lest he become puffed up with pride and fall into the judgment of the devil. And he should have, just to drive the point home, he should have a good witness from those who are outside. Outside of the faith. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Look, when you see these charlatans in the body of Messiah, who, who is it that they're actually bringing into disrepute? This is why we have a thing called atheism, by the way. It's not Charles Darwin that led people away from Yah, it's, it's the charlatans that you know, got people to a place of, well, if this is what you call God, I want nothing or no part of it. Likewise, attendants are to be reverent, not double-tongued, speaking out of both sides of your mouth, not given to much wine, not greedy for filthy gain, holding to the secret of the belief with a clean conscience. Let these also be proved first, tested. Let Then let them serve, if they are, unreprovable the hot, all of this is to do with witness and it ain't your own because if you're stepping into a position of service or an attendant or a deacon if you want King James English for attendant you need to have a good witness to those outside because it's not your name you're carrying this is why when people start asking the questions about the tassels of the zitzits, I always say, make sure you're ready to wear them because everyone will be watching you all of a sudden. Titus 2, but you speak what is fitting for sound teaching. The older men to be sober, serious, sensible, sound in belief, love and in endurance. The older women likewise set apart in behaviour not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of what is good. It's the same things. In order for them to train the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, blameless, workers at home. Good, if you, when you look at this workers at home, it's in the other uh, epistles, is this thing of, you know, the busybodies that go around and talk here and talk there. This is what Paul's alluding to here. Subject to their own husbands. All of that, why? In order that the word of Elohim is not evil spoken of. So that you be a good witness of the one you claim to represent. It's all about witness. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. 
Show yourself to them an example of good works in all matters. Imitate, so Paul would say, imitate me as I imitate Messiah. And he's saying, Titus, now you, what you've learned from me, show that unto them. In teaching, show uncorruptness, seriousness, soundness of speech beyond reproach. This is not, Paul's not saying make sure you've got all your facts straight. He's saying make sure that it's, that goes without say. But is that is without reproach. In order that the opponent is put to shame, having no evil word to say about you. It's witness based. Servants should be subject to their own masters, to be well pleasing in every way, not back talking, not stealing, but showing all good trustworthiness or faithfulness, so that they adorn the teaching of Elohim our Saviour in every way. So that you are a walking demonstration of what it means to be a good servant. Notice it doesn't mention whether the, the, the master is in the faith or not. Servants, be good servants. Titus 3, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. I'm sorry, Paul is speaking of the government here. People will say, oh, this is talking of the priesthood and da, da 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 The priesthood were not in charge. Remember that Rome is in charge. Here. Look, and I have to say, I wish I didn't have to say this every time, but I do. I'm not saying that you do the apps. If the government asks you to sin, there's obviously, there's the line, okay? I'm not saying go and sin. That's not what I'm saying, but... Who appoints kings and tears them down? Yah does. Daniel says it. Nebuchadnezzar was appointed by Yah. Cyrus appointed by Yah. The authorities today allowed to be appointed by Yah. Deal with it. Let me phrase it this way. The authorities we have are the authorities we deserve. Take that whichever way you want. Not to slander anyone, to be, not to be quarrelsome, to be gentle, showing all meekness to all men. All men, not some, not those in the faith, just all men. First Peter 2, like, this is it's everywhere. We never think about it in terms of witness or guarding the honour of Elohim. Beloved ones, I appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which battle against the being or the soul, having your behaviour among the nations good, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, let them, by observing your good works, esteem Elohim in a day of visitation." Be subject to every institution of man because of the master, whether to the sovereign or supreme. Like, this is even Peter's clearly talking government here. Again, the, 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 the line should be when they're asking you to sin. Let me just leave it there. Or to governors, or to those that are sent by him for the punishment of doers of evil and praise for those who do good. Because such is the desire of Elohim that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You're exposing them for what they are, essentially. As free, yet not using your freedom as a cloak for evil, but as servants of Elohim. Respect all, love the brotherhood. This is where you see the difference here. Respect all. So you, everyone, believer, unbeliever, deserves a certain amount of respect. However, the brotherhood, that's love. That's agape here, there. So there is a separation. Fear Elohim, respect the sovereign. Notice here the difference. Fear Elohim, the word there would be reverence, which is closely associated to worship, to the king, which would have been Caesar at the time, respect. That's different. So even Peter's showing there's a difference here. Respect the authorities, but Elohim is the authority. You, you need to fear that one. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the crooked ones. Could make it clearer. 
For this is favour, or if you want King James English, this is grace. The thing by which you've been saved by. Go look it up, for this is grace. It's the same word, uh, uh, charis or charis. Because of conscience toward Elohim, anyone bears up under grief, suffering unrighteously. For what credit is there in enduring a beating when you sin? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure, this finds favour with Elohim. Which implies when it says, when endure until the end, you'll be doing so for, in this uh, context, that you'll be suffering for righteousness sake. This finds favour, this finds grace with Elohim. For to this you were called, because Messiah also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who being reviled did not revile in return, suffering did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his body on the timber, so that we, having died to sins, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were all like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your beings. Hopefully you're seeing this is all about witness. Who do you represent? Where did the apostles and the writers of these letters get these ideas? It was written in their Tanakh. Again, servants, obey your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, sincerity of heart, as to Messiah. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Messiah, doing the desire of Elohim from the inner self, which means it's got to be at the heart level. Like Paul's saying, at, you, you're not manufacturing this. You're actually doing it from the goodness of your heart. Rendering service with pleasure as to the master and not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he shall receive the same from the master, whether he is slave or free. And masters do the same to them. Refrain from threatening, knowing that your own master is also in the heavens and there is no partiality with him. Colossians, whatever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Master Yeshua, giving thanks to Elohim the Father through him. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands, as is proper in the Master. Your own husbands, not someone else's. <laughs> Leaders need to really understand this, by the way. All manners of usurping comes from leadership in this regard. Husbands, however, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. It's a two-way stream. Children, obey your parents in all, for this is well-pleasing to the master. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Servants, obey your masters according to the flesh in all respects, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing Elohim. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the master, not to men, knowing that the mass, from the master you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the master Messiah you serve. But he who does wrong shall be repaid for the wrong which he has done, and there is no partiality. So even the apostles, I believe, were firmly understood this idea of guarding the honour of Elohim, to guard the name of Elohim, to love the name of Elohim. Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or that which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yah, your Elohim, am a jealous El visiting the crookedness of the fathers onto the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love and commitment to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. This is what Moshe was quoting, by the way, when he was interceding for the people. You do not bring 
the name of Yah, your Elohim, to naught. For Yah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. The King James says, do not take his name in vain, which mean, like, it means nothing these days. A better translation is not bringing the name of Yah to nothing. This is a matter of your witness. <clears throat> the word there to bring, Nassar, does not mean to bring. It means to lift, to bear, to lift up. This is where the word Nisuin comes from, the lifting of the bride at the marriage. Do not lift the name of Yahya Elohim to nothing. Do, like, do not drag it through the mud. To affirmingly lift one's hand in a solemn declaration. So lifting your hand in an oath is the same idea. By the way, this word, I might do a series on it, but it's rich. It's, it's to do like with lifting away crookedness. It's to, it deals with sin as well and repentance. So what are you... Essentially, are you going to drag his name through the mud? Are you going to drag it through the mire? Are you going to lift it up and, uh, unto nothing? By taking matters into your own hands. Because when you're doing that, you're saying, I do not love the name of Yah. Remember that name also means authority, character. It's my thinking that one of the final testings to take you from friend to bride is do you really understand this? Notice that all of these first four commands is, I am Yah, your Elohim, so know who I am. Do not have any other gods before me. Do not bow down to them. Do not have carved images. Guard his name. Do not bring his name to naught. Now, let's finish on this verse. This has all been about guarding his name. Guarding his honour. Guarding his reputation. If someone says, I love Elohim and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one not loving his brother whom he has seen, how is he able to love Elohim who he has not seen? And we have this command from him that the one loving Elohim should love his brother too. You can try saying that you love God or honour Elohim's name, authority, reputation, all you want. But can you even do it to your brother? By the way, this is our training ground. This, we learn it with our brothers first so that we can learn with Elohim. This is how I had to learn what agape was, with the brothers, so that I could know it with Elohim. If I can't guard my brother's reputation, his honour, his dignity, can I even guard the king's? This is why I believe that a bride will be granted full authority. This is why Elohim can go... Go in my name because he fully knows that she will guard his honour, his name, his dignity. She'll have learned to do it through the brothers and therefore she'll have learned to do it with Elohim. And I believe that this is what all of the greats of the faith were tested in. Moshe, David, uh, Peter essentially, you know, notice it wasn't a test in knowledge or understanding. It was, the, it, the test is of character. Knowledge, understanding, wisdom, all that comes with time. But Elohim didn't say, well, Moshe, how well did you memorize the Ten Commandments? Did you know the Paleo-Hebrew to this or the pictograph? I'm jesting, but you guys know what I'm trying to get at. It's our heart that's being judged. And all of this today has all been about character. Char character, who are you? And the only way you're going to truly know who someone is, is walk with them over time and let time be 
the revealer of what someone's character is because then you'll know that they'll guard your name. There's brothers and sisters in this room that I know will guard my honour and my reputation. And that's good. So can we do it? Amen?